So welcome back to uh, Stereo Displays and Applications now. And um, I'm very pleased to introduce our first keynote speaker of the week, um, who's a psychologist from the University of Reading in the UK, Professor Andrew Glenister. Um, and Andrew's research work has, into stereo has uncovered many interesting things over the years and has generated some very uh, smart pieces of work investigating how the vision system works and doesn't work. So I hope we're going to learn a few things today. Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I just want to say thank you to all you guys in the uh, stereo displays and virtual reality world, uh, because you've made life for neuroscientists uh, a lot easier. When um, I started um, doing uh, uh, work on, on 3D vision, we used this kind of display, sit static in front of two mirrors. Now we can use virtual reality. We can start asking questions that we weren't able to ask before about uh, what happens when we move around. That raises questions we really haven't started uh, grappling with. And the one I want to ask is, what use is time-expired disparity in optic flow information to a moving observer? What do I mean by that? I mean, when I'm looking here, I get stereo information. I get motion parallax information if, if I uh, move my head around, but if I walk over here and view the same scene, what use is that, is that disparity information, that, uh, op uh, that motion parallax information that I, I got over there? Well, none at all. Unless the brain has some method of storing something that applies that it can build up from the 3D information here, and it can use that same thing that it's built up, representation it's built up over here. And in computer vision, there's an obvious answer to this. It's SLAM. It's, uh, there's a camera moving around here. He's, here are all the images that the camera is getting. And as the camera moves, it adds to its 3D representation in a world-based frame. OK, that's fine. That's very good. It's perfect. It's done. This is from Andy Davison's group, but it's done by all sorts of groups. It's done in autonomous vehicles, as you know. Uh, and it's definitely not used in the brain. The other thing that's not used in the brain is what you'll read in the textbooks, and that's this. You start with visual processing at the back of the brain. The information moves up to uh, posterior parietal cortex we are told. And then, by some magical process, the information gets transferred down here to so the hippocampus. It's actually underneath here. Uh, and in the hippocampus, we have a world-based frame, a bit like that SLAM model I was just showing you uh, of the world. Um, how on earth is that supposed to happen? Well, I mean, if you were mathematical about it, you'd think, is this uh, uh, a three by four matrix, you heard about all this matrix multiplication in the last talk, going on between V1, post parietal cortex, that's, a, that's, that's taking the whole representation that you build in one place and literally shifting it and rotating it before you get to the next place uh, in the brain. Well, uh, no engineer would suggest that, and I don't think it happens. Uh, there's certainly no good uh, evidence when you start looking at it that that's really what's going on in the brain. And nor do we have something that goes from images over to, um, to a 3D world-based frame, which is what SLAM is. So, uh, and, and, and SLAM does that direct without going through any egocentric coordinate frame. So really, we have no idea what is going on. We have no idea what the answer could possibly be to the question I asked, which is, how do we use stereo information here or motion parallax information here to build up something that is useful over here? We have no idea. OK, so in the first bit of the talk, I'm going to suggest some possible ideas that sort of point us to the, where we should be looking. And actually, it's very similar to the kind of things you just uh, been hearing from Greg's talk. Um, and then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about some experimental evidence. So what am I showing here? 
This is like a person moving through a static world. Uh, and the purple things are like mountains. They're like points on the peaks of mountains far away. Okay? So as the person moves around, nothing is going to happen to them. These are near objects. So in the image, they're going to slide around compared to the distant objects. And this sphere, it looks like an eyeball. And what I'm supposed to um, uh, be um, describing with this sphere is the optic array. So it's where all the rays are coming in to an eyeball, but it's a kind of 360 transparent eyeball. And we perceive this. What do I mean? I mean, we perceive an, a, a static world uh, with us moving around in it. But actually, the brain receives something like this. This is the information the brain receives. Uh, and I should describe what I'm drawing here. So the green lines on this sphere connect purple rays, rays coming in from mountains. And what you notice, what you know is, if you were to look at the stars, however much you move your head, however far you walk, the stars don't change. The angle between stars don't change. And that's true of these, these green lines here. But it's quite different for near objects. Near objects, if you hold out your finger and you move your head around, it slides all over the place compared to the stuff that's behind that's miles away. So what I'm drawing attention to is something that the brain could get hold of and learn if it's a baby and it's trying to reach out and make things move, it's never going to do that. It's never going to succeed for things that are far away, but it does succeed for things that are close. And you know, this is not optic flow. I mean, it kind of is optic flow, but only if you process it in a particular way. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting you to process it in a different way. You can't tell what the 3D structure of the scene is just from this information. But sure, you could tell that these two blue rays coming out here are coming from something close because you see that these red lines are all elastic. That just means that things move. If they're close, they move relative to the background. That's all, it, that's all I mean. I'm not saying anything magic here. But I'm saying what we're trying to grasp is what could we store in the brain that survives looking from here, and is still the case when I'm over here, OK? And we're going to abandon an attempt to build a SLAM-like 3D model, but still have something that is true here and also true here. OK, we'll come back to this. The second thing we need to do is do something the brain is able to do. I put to you the brain is not able to multiply by a three by four matrix, to do wholesale coordinate transformations, take a representation of the world in an eye-centered frame and move it to a head-centered frame, and then move it again to a world-centered frame. It just is not built to do that kind of thing. Matrix, MATLAB is built to do that. OK, so what can it do? OK, what I'm, I'm drawing here is uh, that yellow dot is a vector, just like Greg described, a vector describing the current state. Okay, that's like the output of your neural network, the output of the brain. That describes the current state. What am I drawing here in blue? That whole region is a high in a high dimensional space. It's the part of that high dimensional space that includes all the possible states consistent with that action. In this case, it's there could be a predator out there, prepare, OK? So the current state is a subset of that, uh, but there are many other states that are compatible with that action. Then you get some more information in, and you say, OK, uh, I've got more detailed information about the world, but I can't rule out that, that there's a predator there. Stay prepared, OK? So we're in a shrunken uh, part of the scene, part of this high dimensional space. Um, but we're still in there. And then you get more information, and it says, oh my goodness, there's a predator, run. Or, no, uh, we're, we're okay, there's not a predator, relax. Okay, so it's a kind of course-defined description of states. 
Okay, the current state gets refined as more information comes in, and uh, you can see that that's a kind of something that evolution could do. Now let's think about perception in the same way. So this course description here is A is in front of B. I'm about to pick up this cup, and I've got some disparity information about A compared to B, and at the course level, just A is in front of B. As I get more information from disparity, if I just take the raw disparity values, that gives me ratios of depths, but it doesn't tell me exact depth. So it says the surface is elliptical. It might be elongated, it might be circular, it might be squashed, but I know, the, I know it's elliptical of some kind. And then I get more information in, and uh, now I can say, uh, that's definitely elongated, or it's definitely squashed, and vergence is one example of that extra information. But I just want to, to make you think about states and extra sensory information that comes in and allows you to make more refined judgments or more refined actions. And that's the kind of thing you were hearing about from Greg, as you say, that's a cat, no, that's a, or it's a dog, no, it's a husky, you know, it, it's all course-defined descriptions of things, classification, and we should be thinking about perception in that way. Uh, so this is a, a kind of idea that works for perception just as well as it does for action. And it is something neural nets can do, as we've been hearing about. It's something the brain can do. I think no one would dispute the brain can do this. So I'm going to be talking later about an experiment with uh, moving around um, mazes like this. And I just want to point out at this stage, I'm going to be talking about it in the same kind of way, that there's a course description of what's going on, that you learn some topological graph, or I know the red uh, target is down one corridor, I know the blue target is down another corridor, I know the green target is down a different corridor. But later, you add information about uh, uh, the lengths of the corridors, the number of turns in the corridors, and finally, you get enough of that information that you know the exact layout of this maze, or that it's a different one. So this concept of having a course description of the state that you're in, that you gradually refine and refine and refine, I think is A, very useful, and B, as I say, something that the brain could do. So the question is, is this a good way to think about 3D visions, i.e. slowly building up something approximating true geometry? Have I lost everyone? Okay, feel free to ask questions. Uh, outline of the talk, course defined descriptions, well we've done that really. Elasticity, I'll, we introduced, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of uh, surface shape. Uh, and then two experiments at the end, uh, one on updating visual direction and another on navigating, as you saw, navigating in, in, a, in a maze. So we've done the course-defined descriptions. Elasticity. Right, this is my most philosophical slide. Um, this is a person viewing a cube. Okay, what is going on in the brain when a person views a cube? Well, here are all the possible cube um, views of the cube that they could get um, as they viewed this cube. If they moved to the left, they'd get this. As they moved to the right, they'd get this, and so on. This is lots of lots of images of this cube, and the left eye and the right eye are seeing two of those. The left eye is seeing this view. The right eye is seeing that view. And yes, you see a cube when you have a static head and you view something in, with stereo, but it's really because you know that that's a subset of all the possible images that you could get of a cube, which you've seen before, and it is the set of images of that cube that make it a perception of a cube. So people have talked about this before, um, this idea, uh, and I, but I want to put it in the framework that uh, Greg was talking about of a graph of states. So here's one state, in this case one image, an action, in this case a movement of the head, 
and then a new state, in this case, a new image. And I think we should really think about all perception in this framework. Um, again, because it's something that the brain can do, and neural nets, reinforcement learning, is now doing that. They call this a policy network. And we can apply it to lots of things. We can apply it to uh, moving the eye around, saccades. Okay, I'm looking here, I'm getting one image. I make a saccade, I get another image. I make another saccade, I get another image. These are all states that are related by actions. In this case, the action happens to be a saccade, but it's just the same as viewing the cube and seeing it in 3D. Uh, so this is work I did with um, Miles Hansard and uh, Andrew Fitzgibbon. Uh, yeah, and you can read more about that if you want. Um, yeah, this in the reinforcement literature, this that I've just been talking about, this graph of actions is just called um, a policy network. Okay. So I want to talk about uh, seeing a slanted surface and a bump on the slanted surface in this framework. Um, so what am I showing here? I'm showing an eye um, and then some slanted uh, patches facing the, uh, in the world. And this is one of them. And what I've drawn here is some fine scale features on some coarse scale features. They're just patterns on this, uh, on this surface. And then the eye moves, or you go from the right eye to the left eye, it doesn't matter. Um, and what happens is this whole thing squashes, okay? Now that would happen if the s surface was flat, okay? And what I want you to think about is that we can describe all the positions of features on this uh, surface as if they were on a rubber sheet. Now, Kundrink and Van Dorn described this. They said the sensible thing to do in that case is to put your basis vectors, so your, um, your coordinate frame, draw that on the rubber sheet. And then as you stretch the rubber sheet, nothing will change because you stretched your coordinate frame. Okay, And that is true of um, a, a, a surface that is flat. And I just want to show you some psychophysical evidence that uh, the human brain uses a coordinate frame a bit like that. Um, and, and just to point out here, what's happened here is as we went from here to here, I've taken two of these points and I've shifted them. So now they have a new coordinate on the rubber sheet. Okay, They, don't, they no longer fit with the rubber sheet. And that means... Uh, that they have a different depth compared to the flat surface. The rubber sheet was all, if, if everything stays the same on the rubber sheet, then it's on the flat surface. You've got that? But if something, when I move my head, it, uh, it changes its coordinate, it's no longer described by the same coordinates on the rubber sheet, then it is something that has relief relative to the relative to the surface. And that's the thing for which there's psychophysical evidence that the brain is sensitive to that, not to the kind of disparity that you'll read about in the textbooks, but to this disparity relative to the rubber sheet. And uh, there's a bunch of papers on this, uh, and that's uh, Kendrick Van Dorn uh, talked about this, this rubber sheet idea. Uh, so this is what's wrong, uh, this idea that um, you have two eyes and a horopter and that you're most sensitive to things around the Wieth-Muller circle. Um, uh, that's where your b best uh, stereoacuity is. That's really not the case. Uh, and what's true instead? Uh, so this is one picture from this paper that shows um, what the result is. So you have a surface, and what your task is to detect whether uh, at the central point has moved from being right in the center to one of these other locations. And some of them are hard and some of them are easy. And they should be equally easy or hard because they all have the same lateral shift and they all have the same shift in depth. So if your brain was sensitive to lateral shifts or sensitive to 
uh, disparity relative to the Wieth-Muller circle, to the fixation plane, then, um, then these should all be the same. But that's not true. Some of these uh, are easy if they're far away from the plane. Some of them are hard if they're close to the plane. And just to emphasize, I've drawn this in 3D, but uh, relative to uh, this, I'm really thinking about it relative to this rubber sheet, because the rubber sheet uh, coordinate frame is this one corresponding to the flat plane. Okay, so here's the data. Uh, here are the locations that we tested, and you can see this one should be easy to detect because it's far away from the plane. This one should be hard to detect because it's um, close to the plane, and indeed that's true. This one is easy, nice high percent correct, uh, and that's because of this distance. And this is hard to detect um, because it's close to the plane. And that's true of all the other data, too. OK, so take home message. The visual system uses some rubber sheet coordinate frame, uh, as I've been describing, OK, this elastic idea. Oh, and why should it do that? Because it, uh, because it needs to build some coordinate frame. It needs to build something that it can learn about in one location, like here, and is still useful over here. And the rubber sheet. Uh, coordinate frame is one example of that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So uh, this, this uh, framework of the rubber sheet is one example of learning something that's somewhere in between A is in front of B and full metric structure. OK, so finally, on e just to summarize what I've said on elasticity, um, we've talked about elasticity um, in relation to where things are, close things and far things. And we're also talking about them in relation to um, the shape of objects. And um, I've drawn, the, we, we had these green lines and red lines here. The red lines moved, they were elastic. The green were, were rigid. That's also true of how you should think about a slanted plane. If you've got someone um, looking at a slanted plane, like this, from the top, here's a slanted plane. Uh, the, the disparity they get, or the motion parallax that they get, uh, will be like this. This, is, you see, is sort of expanding and contracting as they move their head. Um, they, as they move their head to and fro, um, this will expand and contract. These lines, these green lines, will all stay the same. They don't change, but, the, but this is... <laughs> It's like those green lines are all joined by red bits of elastic. I'm trying to get you to think about learning about images without building a coordinate frame. As you move around, images change. If you learn the way that images change, it's useful. It's useful both here and here. So the person who's learned from uh, moving to and fro this side about this elastic property of the, of the image not 3D, of the image, they know that when they move up and down, this will happen, because these red bits are elastic and the red bits are, and the green bits are rigid, okay? So, as they move up and down, because they knew this, they will learn that this is going to happen. It's useful, okay? It's not just another description of optic flow. If you think that, then it's not, that you haven't got the point. Instead, it's a long-lasting, useful description with predictive power. Okay? It's something for the brain to learn. And it's a kind of intermediate to learning 3D um, structure. Okay, so we've done the elasticity, both for surface shape and for information about viewing distance. Um, so I've, I want to finish by going through two, um, through two uh, experiments. One is about updating visual direction. Uh, and the reason to do that is it's, it's a task that would seem to require a 3D model. So people have said, oh, well, that's all very well. You do all this image stuff. But how could you possibly look at a scene from here and then never see, not see the scene again and then point to something? Okay, that was the challenge. Surely you need a 3D model to do that. And so that's why we did the experiment. And I'll show you. So this is someone doing the experiment. We did it both in virtual reality, of course, uh, but also in the real world to check that uh, it was, there was nothing special about virtual reality. You can see um, Peter here looking at the, 
the targets, which he's later going to have to point to. So he moves his head around. He's got plenty of 3D information about, um, about their structure. Uh, and then he's going to walk down those um, the screens, never see, no, not see them again, and do various pointing uh, to them. Uh, so you see he walks down. And then the experiment, in the real world, so he's being tracked, uh, and there's, his pointer is being tracked. And um, in the real world version, um, he gets told what to point at. And um, I'll tell you the answer. Uh, I'll, tell you, I'll show you a model in a bit. And the model is that the participant represents these as all being in the same plane. And it's a plane that's beyond the right-hand wall. OK? So the, the base counters are really not very good at this. So the challenge to me, which was, was, oh, well, of course you have a 3D model in the head, and of course you can update your visual direction and point it. Well, it turns out you can't, and I'll show you the data. This, we did it in virtual reality as well, um, and it, was, it looks uh, pretty much the same in virtual reality. Um, and here's some of the data. So this is a planned view of um, the scene you've just seen. So Peter was here, looking at the boxes here, and then he walked down here. And this is pointing from this direction. And you can see, making big errors, these are pink in pink are shown the, when he was pointing at the pink one, uh, blue pointing at the blue, red pointing at the red, and so on. And they're all to the north, this direction, compared to where they should be. Um, so the task is view the scene, walk without any further view, point to the objects. And that should be easy to do if we update our uh, location in 3D reconstruction, like SLAM, like you saw at the beginning. All the data are online if you uh, fancy modeling them better than we have. Um, uh, but when you come down here, so you've gone all around the houses down to here, and now the pointing errors are in the other direction. Now he's pointing too far south of the pink box, and that's true of all the boxes. Uh, and that's true of all the participants, as I'll show you here. So what am I point plotting here? The pointing error in the real world and against the pointing error in the virtual world on the y-axis. Uh, so, um, so we repeated the experiment in these two different environments, plotted the data against each other, and they're very well correlated. You get higher errors in the virtual world, but they're highly correlated. So pink means pointing at the pink box, uh, blue to the blue box, and so on. Uh, and they're really quite big errors, but they're highly consistent. And I'll show you some more examples of being highly consistent. So these are two conditions uh, where you walk um, via an indirect route here, plotted on this axis, compared to walking via a direct route here on this axis. Uh, and um, you know, remarkably consistent, but big errors. And these are the uh, means of uh, 20 participants. So here are the raw data. Um, the colors indicate the boxes, and the shape indicates the pointing zone. So triangle for zone C, which was the one down the bottom here, uh, diamond for, uh, for B up here. So all the zone B errors are of one type, and all the zone C of the other type, which is what I showed you at the beginning, that they were all to the north. Hello? I think that's right. Um, uh, another example of highly consistent errors. This is we checked whether, that it mattered whether people were facing south or facing north. Uh, it doesn't. Um, it's heavily dependent on pointing zone. So now I'm plotting the errors from here versus the errors from here. And in, in one case, they're all positive. In the other case, they're all uh, negative. So here are the, the pointings from, from zone A and B. Here are the pointing from zone C. OK, so it really matters where they point. So, so what's going on? Why should, why should that be the case? So a simple model. So what we've done here, all these points here are the maximum lo likelihood location of the boxes given the pointing. What does that mean? That means we take people's pointing errors, and uh, we work out where the most likely location of the box would be to explain those pointing shots. Okay? And then we plot them. 
and you get a pattern like this, and you can see they're remarkably kind of squashed compared to where they should be. Here's where they should be. Here's where the pink box was, and all the pink maximum li li likelihood locations are over here, and so on. So they've all been, s our kind of model is to say, well, let's just assume that the brain thinks they're all on this plane, and we're going to do some more experiments, and we'll see how well that explains uh, people's pointing. So the crucial element of this model, or at the moment it's just a redescription of the data, is um, the orientation of the screen, and then push the boxes further away. Okay, that's all we did. Um, so the participants behave as if they ignore crucial aspects of the geometry of the scene. So all this depth relative to each other, they just ignore. Uh, and it, the responses suggest they assume the objects lie in a plane, which is bizarre. So let's test that out. We're, so this is now a new uh, experiment that we're going to test the model that we are uh, testing the model description that I've just described. Um, and um, we're going to keep everything the same. The pattern of the box is the same, the location of the boxes, the location where you start, and uh, the location where you point. And the only thing we're going to change is the screen. And if the model quotes that I just described uh, is still valid, then that should predict a big change when you change the screen from here to here. Because in this case, you're going to be pushing all the boxes that way. In this case, you'll push all the boxes that way. Okay. Uh, so there's the screen. Everything remains the same except the screen orientation. And the, the, there's the start zone, the pointing zone. Everything's the same. And now we can plot the data that we get in those two conditions against one another. And indeed, they're no longer line up against this 45-degree line. They're different. Uh, so you get quite a different pattern of errors in this condition from this condition. They're not like this. Uh, now let's do the same with uh, different orientations of the screen, different locations that you're pointing. Do the same. And again, they're not the same. They're quite different. And if I, if I take all the, um, the pointing errors that I get in this condition and plot them against the pointing errors that I get in this condition, so there's the target, there's where someone actually points, there's the error between the two, uh, I get to plot those. Uh, uh, and look at the difference between that and that, I should get no difference. But I do. I get a systematic bias here over all the conditions. Um, and that means there really is an effect of the screen. Now, if I push it through the model, then I don't get that effect. So here's someone's pointing. Now I look at the error, not compared to where the, um, uh, the, the target really is, but where the model says the target is. So I've got an angle here. And I do the same. They point somewhere different here. But uh, compared to the model, they've got uh, the same error here and here. And the distribution of errors is around 0. So it's a good model. And this is one final thing. We do the maximum likelihood uh, version and, uh, and, try and uh, say, what are the predicted errors compared to how they actually, um, uh, the, the real errors? And that's not a very good model. Uh, but it's the, the point is, it's the best possible model that you could come up with if you thought that um, people uh, built a 3D model in their head. And, uh, but this, this um, idea of it all depending on the screen is a much better description of the data. So uh, the take-home message here, participants don't behave as if they represent the locations of these boxes at all like this. Nothing like it. OK, so whatever heuristic they're using in their head for imagining is a pretty rubbish system, OK? And it doesn't look like uh, they're building a nice 3D model of the scene and updating it as you would in a slam-like way as you move through the scene. OK, final experiment, navigating through wormholes, which you saw briefly before. Um, and again, the conclusion is going to be that the 3D model is not the best explanation of what they're doing. So here's a, a video of someone doing the task. The task is to find targets in a specified order and point to them. And as they're exploring the scene, there are these little um, gray, there's a target. Uh, it means that they have to go right up to these, um, these gray boxes to examine. Uh, they can't just look down a corridor and see one at the end. They have to uh, put their head in and see whether there's something in them. And they have to then remember uh, where these targets are. And this, in, in the game, this is not um, up here. It's on their wrist. So they can look down at their wrist and see 
what the next uh, target is that they need to, to find. And once they've done that a few times, they then have to point. So you get a, 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 a method of finding out um, where they think these targets are. And this, this is a real, real observer exploring. Um, now, watch what happens when they uh, go through this, because something weird is going to happen. This is a wormhole. So they come up here, and then the scene changes. Did you see that? And they go through this, the scene changes again. When they go through this, it'll go back to the original, um, to the original configuration. And why do we do that? We do that so that we can, um, uh, we can push them to the limit and see what kind of representation they build when the scene is varying like this. So they have a learning phase. They navigate in a particular order. And then they point from the last, box, uh, the last target that they get to. Um, and then, uh, uh, so they do quite a lot of learning and then do three uh, test phases. And that's the data that I'll show you from that part of the experiment. Um, and then they point to all the targets. So this is one of the wormholes that you've just seen. So this wormhole, when they go in, uh, it, the scene changes like that, and then they change it like that. And the green um, target, which is always in the same structure topologically, is hidden in this, inside this wormhole. Uh, and then the, this is really difficult for participants to get their head around. There are three wormholes, and they're shown here. This is the first wormhole that has the red target in. The second wormhole, uh, as you saw, has the green wormhole. And the final wormhole here has the yellow target in. Um, and this is quite difficult for participants uh, to get uh, to learn. But they all have the same topological structure. So one uh, task that I won't talk about the analysis of is learning to get from A to B, but just briefly to say in the metric environment, the normal environment with nothing funny going on, uh, here they have to go from blue to yellow, and mostly they do. Um, when there's one wormhole, uh, they still go from, from uh, blue to yellow. When there's three wormholes, they mostly do go from blue to yellow topologically, but metrically, in the, you know, they're doing a lot of walking around in order to, in order to get uh, from one to the other. Okay? And they uh, usually do choose the shortest topological route um, to get from A to B. Um, so, but, uh, but it's quite complicated. So the topological structure may be the easiest thing for participants to learn. Um, now, I'll show you the, the pointing data now. Um, so this is the goal. So I'm showing you the blue. Uh, they're sh pointing from green to blue. And they're pretty accurate at this. Uh, not so bad here, but really bad. I want to um, take this example of pointing from green to yellow. Because there's a whole series of these. Um, the, the majority of the pointing is about 180 degrees wrong. And that's. I'll show you the data from all the participants here. They're pointing from green to yellow. So green is here, yellow is here, and they're mostly pointing off in this direction. OK? That's what that, the, that means. So w what's going on? Why are they doing that? Um, just to show you that uh, the same is true in reverse, when they're pointing from yellow, uh, they're not so bad, but they're whoa, pretty bad here. They're pointing from yellow to green. So the, here's yellow. And uh, they should be pointing to green out there, but actually, no, they're pointing in this direction. OK, so why are they doing that? Because this is consistent. This is not just random. Um, and here's the data from one participant. So there's fewer data points here. Um, and, but they're doing the same thing. They're pointing out in this direction from green. And from yellow, they're pointing to green uh, in this direction. What we've done here is, uh, as I described for the other one, is just to allow the, um, the target locations to move uh, freely until uh, the, it best, the, the, the configuration of the targets best explains the pointing data. So we find the maximum likelihood location of the four targets that would best explain their data. Uh, so just to be clear, I've in this case, I've taken this, uh, uh, all these pointing uh, directions, 
and moved them over here rigidly, okay? And you just try every possible configuration until you find the most likely one. And the likelihood has got much better um, in this case. So that's the most likely configuration. So we've, what we've done is said, given what this participant has done, what's in their heads? Okay, what's the most likely places that they think these, these spheres, these targets in the maze are, to explain the way that they've pointed? Uh, and then what could possibly be going on in their head? Well, this is our best possible guess. This is where green really is. And that's because when they go in the wormhole, they wander around, and then green is off near this left-hand wall over here, okay? Um, so, but it seems as if participants squash the whole wormhole into this region. And I kind of think, well, that's a, they, they, you can understand why they do that. Because they know if they go from the start location round to blue, that they're near the, the outer edge. And round to yellow, they're near the outer edge. And same with red. And if they go in here, then weird stuff happens. So maybe the whole thing is squashed in there. And uh, so it's as if this location is instead a kind of squashed version of this, which is why we find uh, this uh, explanation of their pointing data. So when you put people in this, this wormhole uh, maze, weird stuff happens to their, um, their, their model of the world. I want to say one final thing on the data, which is um, that's, not just, that's not the only thing that's going on. The other thing that's going on is they get disoriented. So here's someone who, from green, is trying to point to yellow, and they're pointing over here, trying to point to blue, and they're... Um, uh, they're pointing over here. Red, they're pointing over here. They're basically getting everything about 180 degrees wrong. And it is quite confusing in the maze. So if you say, well, let's allow another parameter, which is uh, that they could get all the rotations wrong, then and you freely uh, uh, allow that to vary, you come up with this, which is everything going through 180. Now they're pointing close to the yellow, closer to the blue, closer to the red, not so bad pointing back to start. It's a better explanation than this. So, um, so now I'll show you the data uh, with that rotation allowed to vary. Okay. So this is the original. This is when they uh, move around the ordinary environment with no wormholes in, and um, this is a measure of the likelihood. And so the lower these bars are, the the better. Uh, the, the better the explanation, the, the, the better the likelihood. Now, if you um, allow uh, the, the location of the targets to move around, as I've shown you, and you allow the rotation to, to change, you don't do any, you do worse, essentially, on this measure. This is a measure of likelihood that penalizes you for using extra parameters. And you obviously use extra parameters to do that, and uh, it really doesn't gain you anything. But in the wormhole conditions, it does. So in the wormhole conditions, exactly the reverse is true. So um, when you optimize translation, and you optimize translation and rotation, so that's you allow all the targets to vary in space, and you allow this rotation so that people can be confused and point in different directions, uh, uh, rotate in different directions, they're now, that's now a better explanation of the data. And that's even more true uh, when there are three wormholes. So in the wormhole condition, the best model is one that optimizes location of the targets. So they've got a distorted world in their head and optimizes the rotation. And the point here is that's not a metric reconstruction of the world. That's the thing we've been talking about over and over is do people build a slam-like 3D model in their head? Well, a slam-like 3D model is not one where at every location the north could be somewhere different. OK? That there just is no uh, structural model where that is the case. So it's not consistent with a metric 3D representation in the head. Uh, so summary, people's ability to point to an unseen target may be built up from an initial topological representation. That's what I'm saying, is that the first thing they learn is, oh, red's down that corridor, blue's down that corridor. But I don't know the structure. And later, you add information about lengths and turns. And Bill Warren talks about this as a, uh, a, as a model of what people are doing. And I think it's a good one. So 
Uh, finally, I want to relate it to the sorts of thing that, um, that Greg talked about. So this is reinforcement learning. Uh, and the exciting thing about reinforcement learning, uh, this is, this is a, 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 robot, uh, a, a, a system that is being uh, trying to find a target image. And it's given 10 million goes to, have, to, to try and turn the current image into a goal image. If you give it 50 million uh, frames, then it, uh, it does a better job. 100 million frames, and it does a really good job. OK, so it doesn't know anything about 3D. What it knows about is reward. So you say, you've got the current image. I want you to uh, get this target image. And I'm just going to reward you. The only things you can do are go forward, left, or right. And you don't know what those are other than, um, other than you get rewarded in the end if you get to the right place. Um, and uh, so just to finish on this, the key thing about this, uh, this reinforcement learning is it's using very much the kind of architecture that I was talking about. Uh, there's atomic unit of action and perception uh, for them, and I think for the brain too, is that you have uh, a, a state uh, that you recognize, and it leads to an action. They would call it a policy. Um, and the interesting thing about this, from my perspective, is that it has a sensory component and a motivational component, and which is, in their case, here's the goal. You need to put those together. So you have the sensory state, which is what's the image that I've currently got, the motivational component, which is what's the image that I'm trying to get, and you put those together, and you don't have a 3D map, but you can still navigate in 3D. So. We started with this, which we decided was wrong. And uh, instead, we've got something like, well, the front half of the brain provides the motivational context. It says, this is your current task. This is your current target. The back half says, well, this is, this is what the world is like at the moment. This is the sensory context. And you just put them together, concatenate them into a long vector. And then compare that vector with stored vectors in the same high dimensional space. That's what neural networks do. That's what convolutional nets do. It doesn't matter where that is, um, but it's a great big matrix of vectors that you compare the current state to. And it's very like what the, the neural net guys are doing. And this is the policy network. So. Just to sum up, that's what I've said. Time expired disparity in optic flow. I don't think we're using SLAM, uh, anything like SLAM. And interestingly, the computer vision people are moving away from SLAM. Instead, the brain learns properties of images, how they change with head movements. That gives you 3D structure. How to change one image into a better one. That's what we just saw the, the reinforcement learning guys do. Uh, and that's 3D navigation. This you've seen many times, that's what I've said. But the second half was all evidence from human vision that we don't build a 3D SLAM-like representation. And the first half is we need something more biologically plausible. It doesn't have to be what I have been suggesting, and I've only just been suggesting kind of outlines. Uh, but we do need something. And there's precious few people putting their minds to thinking about what it might be. Thank you to everyone who's uh, helped with the work. Uh, thank you to my funders, and thank you for listening. <laughs>